Charles Ferguson is here. He is a filmmaker who wrote and directed No End in Sight, the 2007 Academy Award nominated documentary. His latest film is Inside Job. It examines the financial crisis of 2008 and contends that the economy's collapse could have been avoided had there been more regulation of Wall Street in the preceding decades. Here is a look at the trailer. Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, they knew what was happening. What do you think about selling securities which your own people think are crap? Does that bother you as a hypothetical? No, this is real. What do you think of Wall Street incomes these days? Excessive. By 1986, he was making millions of dollars and thought it was because he was smart. Chuck Prince famously said, we have to dance until the music stops. Actually, the music has stopped already when he said that. At some point, I used the word Armageddon. These people are risk takers, they're impulsive. I see a lot of cocaine use, prostitution. So do these guys know that they were doing something dangerous? I think they did. Um, I don't hear confessions. What can we believe in? There's nothing we can trust anymore. We had a whole group of people looking at this for Excuse whatever reason. You can't be serious. If you would have looked, you would have found things. It's a Wall Street government. Why do you think there isn't a more systematic investigation being undertaken? Because then you'll find the culprits. I don't believe I have to discuss that with you. You come to us today telling us we're sorry, we won't do it again. Trust us. Well, I have some people in my constituency that actually robbed some of your banks. And they say the same thing. I never heard him mention those things. C could we turn this off for a second? I am pleased to have Charles Ferguson back at this table. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Could we please turn this off? Uh, did you find that often, that when you were pushing, moving in to make what you thought were a point about the contradictions or failure to disclose, people said, wait, this is not what I bargained for? Yes, that happened quite a number of times. Uh, we decided, I decided that it would be overkill to show them all in the film. So, in fact, uh, David McCormick is the only one where we show him saying that. Yeah, because I read somewhere that someone, uh, maybe at Sony, had said, you know, if, in fact, Michigan, if you had shown what it was in fact like, uh, it would have been so devastating it may have turned people against you who thought, is, is that a fairly accurate? Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Uh, several people said when they saw an earlier cut of the film, you know, you can't, you can't do this. Yes, it's all true, but that's exactly the point, is, you know, the, the film and the reaction of the film is going to, be become, is going to become about your destruction of these individual human beings, and that's not what your film is you know, primarily about. It's not what the film is about at all. What's the film about? The film is about the systemic corruption of um, the United States by the financial services industry. That's what the film is about, and the consequences of that systemic corruption. Now, you decided to make this film after the dark days of Lehman Brothers collapse. Yes. Yes, which was, of course, that Lehman, so-called Lehman Weekend, was actually Lehman AIG Merrill right, Weekend. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And, and you decided to make what kind of film? The well, story of, or did you know there was a story there that you wanted to tell? I knew that there was a story there that I wanted to tell. It turned out that the story was even more extreme and even more remarkable and even more shocking than I then realized. But, you know, when, when you get to the point where gigantic financial institutions are uh, collapsing on approximately a daily basis, you know, something's going on. Something big is going on. What did you know... <coughs> What didn't you know when you started making this film that you now know? I would say there are two things, and, and I found them both actually surprising and shocking. The first was the ethical level to which American finance, particularly investment banking, had sunk. You know, if, if somebody uh, had told me in advance that I and we, the world, would discover that Goldman Sachs and most of the other major investment banks had uh, on a systematic basis using tens of billions of dollars had created securities with the intention of causing them to fail so that they could profit by betting against them mm -hmm. I would have said you know no we don't do that in the United States that can't occur people don't do that in the United States well people do do that in the United States they did it on a very large uh, scale for several years 
uh, very systematically, and it turns out that it's not per se illegal. As a practical matter, it's pretty hard to do all that legally, and I suspect that there was massive fraud because it's a pretty hard sale if you're telling the truth. The other thing that shocked me, I have to say, um, was the astonishing incompetence of the government's response during the crisis period of 2008. Uh, the one thing that I thought we could assume with a Treasury Department headed by Henry Paulson, the previous CEO of Goldman Sachs, would be knowledge and competence about the financial markets. And so when someone like Warren Buffett writes a piece in the New York Times or basically says we're damn lucky that we had the people there, otherwise it would have been much worse, you say? Well, it is absolutely true that it could have been much worse. You know, and, and, and Paulson and Bernanke did a number of things correctly. Necessary in term at the moment. Well, that's a, they, they did a number of things well. Uh, the things that they did well were intimately connected with things that they also did very badly. So, you know, it, it, yes, it absolutely could have been much worse. If, if they had sat around and done nothing, yes, we, we could be back to growing our own food at this point. But um, they, they did two things that were deeply wrong, uh, one of which was a matter of competence and the other of which was you know, a matter of ethics or cold-blooded political calculation or some combination of the two. Those the, were? Those were. Uh, the, the incompetence was primarily just being completely unprepared for what was happening. Um, so did they study carefully what would happen if Lehman were to go bankrupt? No. Everything that actually did happen when they forced Lehman to go bankrupt, and forced is the word, um, uh, came as a complete surprise to them. And if, if they had spent any time at all studying Lehman, they would have known that Lehman's debt structure was intimately connected to the money markets, intimately right, right. connected to the commercial paper market. They would have known that British bankruptcy law would have forced the closure of the right, London office, right. you know, et cetera. Right, right, right. Disaster, disaster, totally avoidable disaster. And the other thing, of course, was that the things that they did, even the things they did well, saved the banks and they didn't save the rest of the American population, and they didn't force the bankers to take any sacrifices at all. On this program, Barney Frank said that, that the Treasury and Hank Paulson didn't have the authority to save Lehman. Barney Frank. Mm. Uh, how impolite a word could I use? Anyone think you want to say? <laughs> no, any, choose your word. I'll use They'll probably this. bleep it out, but it's too bad, but choose your word. Well, uh, it, it's, you know, horse manure. It's organic matter emitted by a but large animal. But this is Barney animal. Frank who you use here. Yeah, Barney Frank is, a, is a, uh, on balance, a very good guy. He's a politician, though. He's a politician. Uh, may I note that about 24 hours after they failed to save Lehman, they managed somehow to find some reason to give AIG $85 billion. Yeah. And, and what was the difference uh, in their mind? Well, that's a very good question. I would love to be Henry Paulson's psychoanalyst. There have been, uh, people have speculated, there's a long list of potential explanations. The only one that we're fairly confident has no real force is the one that they officially gave, namely that they couldn't, in fact, save the company. Uh, in fact, Paulson has said <coughs> now, uh, according to, say, a column by Andrew Ross Sorkin, that if he'd had the resolution authority that is now in the financial reform bill, he could have done it. Well, it, it is now true that right. there's, uh, there's an official, above-board, comprehensive way to, uh, to take over such institutions. But, in fact, there were 28 things that they could have done. Uh, Lehman had already asked, for example, to be given status as a bank holding company. They had refused. I mean, I, I don't well, know which how later, many... Which was later given to which, Morgan Stanley Which a Goldman few Sachs, days right. later was given to Morgan and Goldman. Uh, it, you know, I don't know how tedious you want to get about the details of the mechanics of this, but they absolutely could have done something if they had decided that they wanted to. Now, why did they choose not to? There's, you know, again, there's a list of reasons. The, most of the top management of Lehman was Democrats. There was only one Republican, a relative of George Bush, in the senior management. Lehman was emerging as a substantial competitor to Goldman. He wanted to make an example of Lehman. He, he had, as a matter of personal dislike, he hated Richard Fold, which put him in a very large club, by the way. A lot of people didn't like Mr. Fold. As, as you point um, out, some of his largesse. Yes, indeed. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's the ego reason. You know, he wasn't able to put together a private thing to save Lehman, so 
could he admit that he'd made a mistake? Could he, you know, et cetera? You know, so what combination of these is true? I don't know. Yeah. And moral hazard played nothing in it. It may have. It may have. Uh, but uh, it, it, let's put it this way: he certainly made the point a little more forcefully than perhaps he uh, intended to, since it turned out that he. Um, he froze up the commercial paper market almost overnight, and you know people were truly terrified. After Lehman Brothers, after Lehman yeah, Brothers, right. when he yeah. forced Lehman, and, and so Brothers therefore people who went to uh, overnight to get commercial to sell commercial paper could. Well, I in fact, you know, large, very secure corporations, you know, AT and T for a week couldn't borrow money. General Electric. That's right. You know, I don't know whether how long it lasted, but there was that moment in yep. which Jeff Immelt has said, "Yep, I didn't know." Yep. All right. Terrifying. Was it illegal? Uh, if you're referring to the behavior of the financial institutions and bankers during the bubble, my own view is that there had to have been massive illegality. Um, I, you know, I don't want to point to individuals because the justice system should do that and I shouldn't. But we already know uh, that Merrill Lynch engaged in massive self-dealing to prop up artificially the prices of its securities. We already know that Lehman Brothers used a variety of accounting tricks to inflate its assets and also uh, decrease artificially its liabilities. We already know that a half dozen investment banks massively, massively created securities that they hoped to profit from primarily by betting against them. Are these the same kinds of things uh, that people who worked at Enron went to jail for? They're very similar, and as a practical matter, I, I am absolutely certain that these things could not have been done for as long as they were, as successfully as they were on the scale that they were, without people committing massive criminal fraud. Do you expect that there will be prosecutions for criminal wrongdoing coming out of what we now know and what you point out in your in your film and people have pointed out in all the books written about this crisis which now must be numbering up close to 50. Many. Yes, <laughs> many, many. Uh, whether there will be or not, unfortunately, I, I have to give this, you know, quite depressing answer is a function of political pressure um, because it is it is unfortunately disastrously, tragically clear that the Obama administration has no interest in doing anything about this. Um, and, and the reason is? That's a very good question. I'd like to be President Obama's psychoanalyst also. And, and again, there's a menu of answers ranging from he's personally very conflict averse to cold-blooded political calculation to uh, uh, lack of experience and therefore insecurity in very large-scale economic and financial matters and therefore being the prisoner of, of his advisors. Perhaps some combination of all of those things. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know Mr. Obama. I you know, only met him once for a few minutes. You said finally that there are three changes to make uh, in order to make the system work better. One is to uh, change the role of money in elections, two is to pay regulators well, and three is have law enforcement uh, that's necessary to enforce the laws we have. Yes. Expect will, those things will happen? I think someday they will. I think it's going to take, uh, my own view is that, and, and other people with whom I've spoken share this view, is that when President Obama was elected, he had a very, very special opportunity of a kind that comes once a century maybe to really change this country for the better, to reverse what's been happening to this country for the last quarter century. Um, and he blew it. He, he, he let it pass. And now that he let it pass, his political situation and our collective political and social and economic situation is very difficult. And now it's going to be a very gradual uphill fight. You know, it's going to look more like the civil rights movement or the environmental movement to, uh, for, for the American people gradually to exert enough pressure so that we have a government again that actually governs and regulates and keeps control and tries to make the society fair again. Would you like to see somebody challenge him in the Democratic primary leading up to the 2012 election? If it was the right person. You know, I, I, I'm not a partisan person. I'm not a political person. I've never run for office. I never will. I've never served in a government. You know, I view my function as 
policy analysis and investigative journalism. But do I think that this is a terribly, terribly important problem? Yes, I do. And, and you know, I, I think we're in danger, unless we do something about this, I think we're in danger of finding uh, that America has become a very different place far from the dreams of its founders. Not only that, the, the world has changed dramatically in terms of where the power centers are too. Well, of course, you know, of course, but, but even, you know, regardless of whether we in our individual daily lives care whether America is the preeminent world power, I hope that we all still care that people who are born poor have an opportunity to educate themselves, have an opportunity to make a good living and provide for their own children, that this is still a country of opportunity and freedom. And that ought to be the great debate that we enter. I certainly think that it should be, yes. Yes. And, and I fear that we're now in a situation in which we have a political duopoly um, in which neither political party challenges um, those issues and, and challenges, uh, yeah. yeah. And there's a majority in the country that, that you think is ready to be I hope so. tapped into. I hope so. You know, I, I think that what's happened is, is that the majority of the population that should and in fact I think does share this view that something deeply wrong has happened with regard to these questions is unfortunately divided, perhaps intentionally by the parties, perhaps not, is unfortunately divided according to other social issues, you know, whether or not someone believes in gun control or gay marriage or religion in schools or, um, you know, those kinds of issues, and or abortion, you know, and those are important issues. I don't mean to suggest that those are not important issues, but there's another issue, this one, that is that is corroding this society and, and it's endangering everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us.